Hey, how's it going everyone? Just back again with a video. This probably won't take too long, but I want to go through um, a response to the, the black swan image. And so this black swan has come out and I'll show what that is again. I've done a full video on it. That um, to me is an absolute globe killer. And then we've had time for the ballers to come back with something. And so this would this video is for me to be a rebuttal to that rebuttal. And so I call this rebuttal to the rebuttal to the black swan. And so the technical arguments that I've heard, um, you know, I've listed here by three uh, characters on the ball earth. Uh, Ruhif has stated that um, there's infinite refraction involved. Rumpus has said a K value of one circular rays. And Dean has, says looming, has said looming. And so uh, I'm going to show how these are all essentially the same thing and actually sequential uh, from the top down and um, just go through really what they're saying you know with a, a few cartoons uh, some pictures some visuals um, some intuition and then just show how the flat earth position is much more technically sound so here we go uh, first off this is the black swan image uh, it's a video actually but this is a still capture and so less than five foot observer height five foot is on the upper bound um, we see these two platforms, these oil rigs, uh, one at nine miles away, and then we see uh, the horizon even in the distance. And so if we're on a ball according to the baller theory and NASA and all the government propaganda, the, the geometric horizon, the limitation of visibility should be around two and a half miles. And so uh, this is over, let's say, nine and a half to ten miles. And we don't even know actually how far that is. It could be further. We don't know. Um, but it's at least uh, nine and a half miles. And so uh, this is impossible geometrically on a ball unless you um, cite uh, these things that Ruhif, Rumpus, and Dean have cited. Um, and they're all essentially the same thing as I'll show. So this is it. And um, just uh, this, I, I've copied this from Rumpus's infamous PDF. And um, this is what he keeps showing us and never explains anything really related to this. They're just a bunch of pictures, but I'll try and bring a little bit more clarity to this, you know, with respect to the black swan. And so obviously they always start off on a ball. They have this eyeball here, which is the observer. In this case, it's a lighthouse. And then just uh, imagine, I guess, if we have the sun up here um, producing uh, light rays that bounce off of this structure, and then they'll meander over to this eyeball. And so just think of light coming down in obviously all directions, hitting this. Technically, the ballers um, fail when they have a 93 million mile sun because they believe the light come in parallel. But that's a different, um, you know, argument. But uh, normal people, us, we know that the sun is local. And then so the, the light rays are coming down at all different angles, hitting this structure. And then uh, some will be uh, making a journey uh, from this structure to this eyeball over here. And so that's what all these different lines are sort of trying to represent. And then he draws a line here flat. This is what the observer would see, this eyeball. This would be the, quote, line of sight. And so in this condition where this there's a light ray here that will make it to this eyeball from the bottom of this structure, uh, the observer will actually be able to see the bottom of this lighthouse and also the top. And so this is what the observer is seeing. And then this is the physical reality. So this is a, obviously the, the, the baller theory. Um, this is what they really have to say in order to be able to see anything. And so Rumpus is technically right when he keeps saying everything looms all the time. Um, every object looms all the time. And that is true. That is exactly what would be needed in order to see anything um, over a curved surface. And so uh, I'm going to use this cartoon as sort of the foundation. And so just to reiterate the point I just made, we'll use this red line as the what the uh, what the person actually sees, for example, in an image or a video. That's the 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 base, uh, the lowest uh, level um, that it can see. And then the extent of this would be the um, the optical horizon, the apparent horizon. <clears throat> and so let's imagine these two yellow dots as two droplets of water that um, one is, let's say, about midway between the lighthouse and the observer, and then one is past this lighthouse. And so in this um, black swan image, we're seeing uh, light bounce off of the, the water beyond this platform and reach you know, the observer. And so it would represent this yellow dot over here. So this horizon 
which represents a water line intersecting with the the uh, the sky um, for us the firmament um, that is uh, this line back here and so that represents this um, yellow dot right here <clears throat> so this is the furthest we can see in this uh, black swan image and so in order for us to see it it has to make its way up along this um, visible line uh, the the base of what we see and so this is the part where ballers will say that this yellow dot is looming because it has to loom up along this red line and so this this dot will have to loom further quote further than this uh, than this one here along the midpoint because it needs to go up to some point somewhere along there and so this is what is required really to see anything far distances along a, a curved surface <clears throat> and so this is the baller's definition of looming. I'm not supporting this definition, obviously, anything that the ball earthers say. Um, you know, all these, these three people are just paid liars. But this, I'm just using their terminology so we understand what they mean when they say looming. Uh, it's actually even written right here. You can see Rumpus's uh, notation. Images of the observer experiences experience for no refraction and looming for the scenario above. And so, you know, just that's what they mean. You know, that um, this water droplet that is behind the oil platform the furthest one is is um looming up to this uh line of sight this red line and you know this one <clears throat> let's say this one represents the closer oil platform you know we can see that it's looming as well and so this is again their position so <clears throat> just to clarify so in order for this to happen in order for these two yellow dots to make it to this red line of sight this yellow dot would need to experience a light ray. Again, let's imagine a sun up here hitting this water uh, droplet um, and then curving, and this is this green line that I drew, and making it to the, to the eyeball. That's what would happen in order to make this possible, <clears throat> in order for this yellow dot to make it again, again, this line of sight. And so this is the math that's required. This is the optics that's required, is that a light ray, many of them, at least one, needs to come and hit this yellow ball, this yellow dot right here, and then travel along the surface of the earth and make it to this uh, observer, whether it's a camera or a human eye. Um, this is required. And so this is the part that I'm going to kind of dig in a little bit in this um, presentation and show how that's um, exactly what they're saying here and how that's uh, not physical. <clears throat> okay, so just keep this in mind. This is their stance. So. When Rumpus talks about um, circular rays or uh, surface rays, he's talking about this um, instance where a ray can travel fairly tightly coupled to the Earth's surface and make it to the observer. And so just to kind of take away all of his, um, you know, just to kind of clean up all of this, just simplifying it. Again, we have this yellow dot. We have, just to use an example, this oil platform. This yellow dot represents the furthest point that we can see. Um, in the horizon, in the distance, and then um, this here is an eyeball. And so, <clears throat> again, this is the exact you know uh, line that um, arc that is needed. Again, it's not going to be doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly concentric with Earth curve, but it needs to physically. I want people to understand that physically make its way, and the light ray needs to interact with this yellow dot, and then also interact with this eyeball. And so, there is an actual physical connection between these two and um, by the light ray. And so that is what's required uh, for the ballers uh, to again explain uh, this image. <clears throat> and I'll explain how that is all of these three things uh, linked together. And so now just to get into a bit more of the details of what's required. <clears throat> so let's say we do have this yellow dot and then this green arc representing the light ray. These black lines represent slopes or directions or derivatives and so they're all the same thing in this case we would have a light ray again at least one that is moving along the surface of the earth and constantly changing direction so uh, this is a requirement you know this is a geometric requirement for this light ray uh, no one would argue that that there is at least one light ray that is needed uh, to travel um, over a curve you know that's uh, absolutely necessary especially when we're talking about you know, 5, 10, 15 miles away. Um, 
these change in directions are appreciable. And so um, that's what these black lines represent. I mean, I, I need to draw technically an infinite number of them because um, over a ball, the, jet, the direction is changing constantly. Um, and so I just drew four of them here, but just to get the idea, <clears throat> there is a uh, change in direction happening at every point along this green path. So this, from a mathematical perspective, this black line has a higher derivative than this one, and this one has a higher derivative than these. And so just to kind of keep this presentation fairly simple, um, just to give some understanding of how the, what the ballers believe is uh, insane uh, technically, a derivative simply means a rate of change, or in two dimensions you can call it a slope. It's referred to as, uh, I believe, a directional derivative or a gradient in three dimensions. But for this example here, you know, in 2D, because they like this um, Muppet vision anyway, um, we'll feed it back to them. This is a derivative. And so for ballers hoping that rays curve around a ball, a change in derivative, again, just think of it as change in direction, means a change in the ray's direction. So this ray that's leaving this yellow ball dot is going along one direction and then it's constantly changing as it traverses over the surface of the earth. And this would require a change in density. And so light rays don't just magically decide to change direction. It'll only change direction if it experiences a different density, a different medium. It has a quote reason to change direction. And so this is the question that we have to um, hold the ballers to. How is a ray that is tightly coupled to the earth, and we know that this observer is, like I said, less than five feet off the surface of the earth, and then this um, yellow is, uh, is, is the surface of, of, the, of the earth, in this case, water. Uh, it cannot go very high because, again, it's the lowest ray that is meeting this uh, eyeball, and um, so it's tightly coupled, fairly tightly coupled to the earth, so we wouldn't expect a drastic, really even a, if at all, density change along the surface of the earth. They need to explain to us what is motivating this ray to, um, like I said, perpetually change direction constantly in order to make it to the observer. And so that's, uh, that's their issue really here, and it's really the three Ds. The derivative uh, implies a change in direction. Uh, Rumpus may call this a gradient, um, and he may even invoke higher order statistics, which you need to, or higher order mathematics because um, that's what's needed to govern the propagation of this light ray. But either way, it's whether it's a, a gradient, uh, second order derivative doesn't matter. It's still fundamentally this ray has to keep changing direction. So this derivative implies a change in direction. And then for optics, just basic properties of optics, there would need to be a density change in order for this ray to not continue going in the direction that it started. And so <clears throat> this is the killer right here, the three Ds. And so we need them to explain to us what is happening in this, uh, what George calls optical corridor, What's happening in this channel to make this light ray do this, bending? They need to explain to us what is so special about the, the material inside here that I'm kind of highlighting with my cursor. What's going on in here? What, what is going on in here that's, that's motivating this constant change in direction and um, allowing this light ray to stay tightly coupled to the Earth's surface and then make it to this eyeball? And Rumpus calls this a K value of 1. And so just to kind of summarize the, their, their whole argument uh, for kind of in uh, simplified terms is um, Ruhif stated on record that this is infinite refraction and, and that is true. It has to be because there's, like I said, there's an infinite number of changes in direction. And so again, like if we go back to this, a change in direction requires a change in density, which is um, refraction, light bending. And so infinite refraction, what he's saying is there's infinite um, change in direction, if you can think of it that way, or you can think of it as an infinite change in derivative. So at every point along this line, there's a constant change in derivative and a constant change in direction, and thus, and thus would require a constant density change in order for the light rate to curve. And so he is correct. In this <clears throat> case, if it were to ever happen, which obviously it doesn't on a ball earth, because uh, we don't live on a ball, but this would require an infinite, infinite refraction, infinite bending around this uh, earth curve and that would produce what rumpus is stating uh, he calls them circular rays i like to call them surface rays but um, that's what it would produce and then the end result to the to the observer is what would be known as looming and so that would mean that this yellow dot would appear up here visible to the to the person 
And so this is the non most non-technical description of what's going on here, but it is the optical result of these two things. So infinite refraction, uh, which would mean infinite change in direction, produces surface rays or circular rays. And then the way to lump those together, according to the ballers, I'm not saying that this is the correct definition of looming. This is their understanding of looming over a, over a curved surface um, that that would result. And so they're all saying the same thing. It is actually the same story. It's just um, packaged together with different language, but um, it's all the same thing. So if you imagine this green line, each dash requires a new density and thus can can incur a change in direction along the surface of fictitious ball earth. And I highlighted the word can because just because there's a density change along this journey doesn't mean that it wants to constantly stay along the earth's surface. I mean, it has freedom to go in any direction depending on, again, the density change. And so they need to show us what magical density chamber optical corridor is, is providing this nice smooth consistency. I mean, we know now at this point, this is what's actually going on. We live on a flat earth. This yellow dot represents the point beyond the furthest platform. And on that day, during that day, in that moment, um, there was a nice clean line of sight. <clears throat> you know, the, the, um, the, whatever was happening above the water that day just provided a nice clean channel, optical corridor as George calls it, for this light ray to um, stay tight to the Earth's surface and be at a large distance, 10 miles away, and make it to the uh, BMSLB 69's camera. <clears throat> so this is, this is what's actually happening. We don't have to have infinite number of changes in direction. We don't have to have any um, unusual or non-realistic, non-physical mathematics to make this happen. We just need a day where um, there, the, along the surface of the water, there is a nice clean channel uh, for this light ray to make it you know, to the, um, to the camera. And so this is why ballers will look at an image like this and get nervous, not so much also because the horizon is very, very far away, but these oil rigs are, are pretty clean. You know, There's a little bit of very, very minor distortion here, but for the most part, the structure is intact for both of these. And again, this is almost 10 miles away. This is pretty far. Um, you know, we're not looking at something you know, just uh, 10, 15, 20 feet away. <clears throat> So we expect distortions, especially with these um, sort of isolated objects that um, are not as sort of structurally uh, tight as, as the actual platforms themselves. And so um, this is just local distortion, you know, that let's say just, I don't know this, but um, I believe Ranty has suggested this, that, um, that these uh, booms sticking out um, could potentially be sort of a duct or a conduit for... Um, air leaving, you know, and then it'll be a different temperature than the actual platform itself. And so that will lead to these kind of very, very minor distortions. But that's why when ballers are citing, like I said, infinite refraction, they need as much distortion in the image as possible. That's why ballers will refer to this as a dirty image <clears throat> when it's actually very, very clean. Um, ball earthers do not like clean images because then the horizon will be visible far away. And then, you know, they'll have to then cite infinite refraction and um, in order to produce these kind of results. And so they're going to like mirages, they're going to like all kinds of distortions because then anytime those things exist, then they'll have obstruction and then obstruction will always start bottom up first. <clears throat> and so this is, uh, that's all they can say is they have to look at this and then talk about how distorted this is when really there's minor distortion. There's clearly no way that there's infinite refraction. Infinite refraction would be the most chaotic channel that a light ray would have to go through in order to get to the observer and it would never produce something this clean, you know, and certainly not a, not a horizon that is that well defined um, 10 miles away, 10 plus miles away. So this is the story um, that, uh, <clears throat> that ballers will have to cite. I just want people to know, first off, the very foundation of their argument is non-physical because they're requiring infinite number of changes in direction along this surface, which will produce these surface rays. And um, infinite anything is just non-physical and uh, a fairy tale uh, from these uh, math, math magicians, uh, Ruhif the Rumpus and Dean uh, Stingray. So it uh, looks pretty good. We're on a flat earth. Hope everyone's doing well. Take care. Bye.